Okay, we are live on Facebook and to the world and to the public where we are on episode four of Secrets of Success, where it's a podcast with me, Dr. Shane Needham, where our theme is never be outworked. And so let's continue on some introductions here. Thank you all for joining us. Now today, we're actually going to be taking questions on Facebook live. So give those questions to us. We'll try to respond to the, the ones that we can. We're going to be talking about the economy and COVID-19 with a executive director who happens to be a friend of mine and an executive director of a global, net, a global company who um, is, he's in charge of over $2 billion in assets. So I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. I want to talk a little bit about the podcast. This is episode four. This is our, well, I guess second week where we've had an uh, average of two guests a week. It has been phenomenal where we've had a pastor talk about faith and COVID-19, where we've talked about in my industry, which is analytical testing, where we've talked about testing for COVID-19, had a, a global expert in that area. Um, episode three, we actually talked about anxiety and COVID-19. Those episodes have all been edited, compressed, and they are available on my YouTube channel, SoundCloud, Spotify, and iTunes, as all of our episodes will be in the future. And so I'll be rolling those out and letting you know more about them next week as well. And also visit my website at drsneedham.com where you can have all that information too as we get ready to roll that out. So a little bit more about, about me before we talk with, with Dale. So I, I am many different things. I've never wanted to be put in one box. And so I'm a disciple. Um, my savior is Jesus Christ. I'm a, a disciple, father, scientist, entrepreneur, bodybuilder, power lifter, a coach, a mentor, a motivational speaker. Go check out my TED Talk online and on my website, website as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I, during this quarantine, I've started a podcast and it's just been amazing where we give a voice to people who may not have a, 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 a voice, especially people in the financial industry. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, I have, I have my own business, but also I'm a scientist. And a lot of times we speak in different languages and we um, write in journals and uh, in articles where sometimes people don't understand it. So I want to give a voice to those, especially in a time of a pandemic like this, where we're, we're worried, we're, we're anxious, where we don't know what's going on, that we can have a voice to the people that may not talk the science or the business, the financial aspects that we can put it in a language that they can understand. So then they can make their, their appropriate decisions for themselves and their family. And so that's what we really want to talk about. And so, um, I, I am on online with uh, Dale Miller. He's actually in Moscow, Idaho, the same place that I am. We don't live too far apart, but obviously there's a quarantine. So he is going to zoom in from his house. Now, I want to explain the hats. First of all, it's Saturday. At least we didn't show up in our pajamas, right? All right. I guess everybody's probably been in their pajamas the last month or so. But Dale and I both had some unfortunate haircutting incidents. Mine was getting pretty wild. And so, you know, I'm just covering it up with a hat. So, Dale had an unfortunate haircutting incident where he showed me about it. And uh, let's just say the razor didn't have the guard on it. So he has a nice reverse mohawk in his hair. Is that correct, Dale? No longer. We uh, shaved to match. Oh, okay. So he shaved the whole thing off. That's good. <laughs> well, what, well what's they, what do they say? The only, thing, the only thing different between a bad haircut and a good haircut is three days? Yeah, it's growing. <laughs> good. It looks look fine. It's much easier to take care of. Excellent. So, so Dale, why don't you introduce yourself and we'll go kind of over, after that, we'll go over an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Uh, well, I've been on Wall Street for almost 30 years next year. Congratulations. And that's a long time. So I've seen a bunch of crises come and go. Um, I manage a team of people a lot smarter than me who uh, help manage with private clients, corporate clients, all sorts of other things. I've, I've been a bond trader. And kind of been around the block a few times. It's kind of weird to wake up and realize I'm the old guy now. I'm, I'm the experienced guy with all the gray hair. But the wise, the wise it, one. Uh, depends on how you look at it. So <laughs> it's uh, it's been an interesting ride. But increasingly, you know, I realize things are so cyclical, and we're definitely in a cycle here. So this is uncharted territory, but we have been here before in some ways. But I'll go into that a little bit more. Excellent. Excellent. So we are going to talk about that. What we're going to talk about is, first of all, what I like to always tell people, because what I realize is that the older and older I get is the most important thing to me in my life are the relationships that, I, that I've had. And many of those have been built through business, um, through 
through business, through, uh, I was a wrestling coach. Um, that's actually how I met Dale was I actually coached his kids and he has a wonderful family. And, and so, uh, you know, that's what I, we're going to talk about that first, like how we met. And then we're, then I want to talk about to Dale about what the current effects of COVID-19 have been and the pandemic and the government shutdown and isolation, what, how that has affected the economy. And then about government intervention. Was it, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And it really doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It is what it is. So the, more, the, better, the better question is now what? And then we'll talk about you know, predictions for the future economy. How will this come out different? What, what are we optimistic about? In other words, what good is going to come of it? Because something will, a lot of good is going to come of it. I don't, I don't know what, but I, I have some ideas and I want to hear what Dale's ideas are. How has some business changed forever? And will some of it ever be the same? And what about our physical policy? Has it changed now? Um, and what opportunities do we see right now in markets and in business? And I think one of the important things I want to get to, Dale, is what would your advice, you know, with your almost 30 years of experience on Wall Street and trading and businesses and cyclical um, financial information and, and markets, is what would your, you know, I want to take home message of what your advice would be to people. To the, you know, maybe the common investor that, you know, has worked 30 years for the same company or 20 years for the same company and they have a, a lot in a 401k, what would you suggest to them? And so that's kind of how we'll, how we'll, we'll kick it off. So Dale, I, I want to hear about your story about how um, we met and then I'll tell you mine and how, how I remember it. So please, let's start there. Boy, that, that might be uh, interesting. You didn't press me for that. Um, before I start, I actually have to make a statement just because of what I do for my day job. So I, I need to say opinions that I express here are just my own. They don't necessarily represent the views of my firm nor any of its affiliates. Nothing expressed here constitutes a recommendation for the purchase or sale of a security. So that's out of the way. Hopefully lawyers are happy and uh, let's get on with that. So um, I don't remember the exact first time. I think I walked in that ginormous cavern of a wrestling barn you yeah. built yeah. Uh, to improve the, you know, the wrestling program in our local community here yeah. and uh, saw just a whole bunch of kids being coached, literally an organization is what I saw. And, you know, my kids got into it. They had just a great, a great time, a lot of fun. And uh, so that's how I remember. And you just, I don't know, I, I remember you used the Energizer Bunny. I was like, who is this guy? Good grief. He's like a spark plug. <laughs> That, that was my initial impression. Now, <laughs> when I showed up, I was probably trashed at the end of a long day and drooping. So I don't know how you remember that. No, you know what? I, I remember that same thing. And I just remember, here's what I, I remembered about it and, and then learning more about you. And this is what's awesome in our, and I think we're learning that in our current climate where we're all socially isolated. So um, I remember, so just a little bit of the story for those people that don't know, you know, that are across the country, across the globe, globe that are watching is that um, I was wrestling coach um, in, at Moscow Wrestling Club. It's a local wrestling club and also at the high school for a time period. And there was no space. There was no more space for us to practice. And this club started out, I took it over. When I took it over, there was about 22, 23 kids. And it just started growing and growing and growing. And there was just one group at that point. And um, at one point when I was growing it, it would, there were five groups and we had no other places to practice. We had almost a hundred kids and not, not, there was not enough space in town to practice. And so I'm like, well, well, let's solve this problem. So I built a really large wrestling facility that was just, I'll never regret it. Never. It large worked. meaning the size of some small schools. <laughs> It, it was actually a full-size basketball court. It could have been it was large. Yeah. <laughs> 75 by 100, 5,000 square foot of mats and four bathrooms and a loft. And we'd have wrestling camps and clinics in there. And it was just a blast. And to be honest, the Energizer Bunny were the kids and the parents. I just loved to be around them. And they were absolutely incredible. And they inspired me every single day. So that was the, the wrestling part about it. I remember Dale works a lot. He works really hard. It's a perfect example of never being outworked. So I found out later that he grew up, born and raised, Moscow, Idaho, and then all of a sudden, you know, got some good schooling, but more importantly, he worked his tail off and was on Wall Street and then came back to Moscow because he liked the quality of life, but still spends a lot of time in Seattle and traveling and whatnot. And it's, I, I was just like, wait a minute, this guy lives in Moscow, Idaho, and he manages $2 billion of funds. And that was incredible. And I just love that, that the, that's the world we live in, that if you truly work hard, 
and you have that mindset of putting in, getting out of putting in, knowing that you're going to get out what you put in is you can do anything. And that's what I was like. So I was taught, cause I just started to listen to him about finances and economy and businesses and valuations. And I was like, wow, this guy is somebody I want to know. And I've learned so much from him. So that was, that's when I first met you. And I was like, impressive, really, really impressive. And I was so thankful for all those parents and kids that I met during that time when I was coach. So you gave me a great first impression, by the way, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really, so you asked the question, you know, what would I advise people? Yeah. Um, just to have a 401k working for a company. When you get times like this, there's this instinct to want to do something, to want to trade around it, to try to change something. And the reality is once you get into markets that are this volatile, once you get into a crisis, Wall Street already acted a long time ago. So to try to get really fancy, um, anybody that tried to get out, quote unquote, two weeks ago, they just lost out on a nearly 20% rally. Yeah. So there's a lot to be two, said. The two, weeks ago, two weeks ago. Yeah, literally. I, and this, I, this was I, the I, fastest I went in. decline. This two was weeks the fastest ago, decline ever. Absolutely. And I knew, and now, I mean, that's what I did. Like two, two weeks ago, I took cash. I dumped it into the market because I knew it was going to come back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, markets have always come back, come back inevitably. Now, how long does it take? That's, that's another story. Usually, the sharper the fall, the more rapid the comeback. 2008 was a long, slow, painful decline. It didn't bottom out. But there's a saying on Wall Street that bear markets end with recessions. Recessions don't cause bear markets. Bear markets end when the recession starts. And that's been very common. I could show you charts on my screen if my screen shared. So that's something to remember. And also just asset allocation is the main thing that makes a difference. Trying to time the stock market is impossible. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work. And those that tell you it does are lying or selling newsletters. Yeah. That's pretty so, much. So you're well, saying- We've all been lucky one or two times in our career. Like, ha, got out, got back in. Look at me, I'm a genius. Warren Buffett doesn't do it. All he does is look at absolute valuations. Nobody does it. And I know billionaires. I have some almost billionaires as clients, several of them. And we talk all the time. And the weird thing about politicians, CEOs, billionaires, whatever you want to say, you know, you've met a few. I've shaken a couple of presidents' hands and known a lot of governors. You know, guess what? They're people and they're not any smarter necessarily than they may have different types of intelligence, political intelligence, whatever. But they're no smarter than the rest of us. They do their best with what they have. And we all muddle through. And guess what? Markets recover, economies recover, everything always recovers. So what you're does, saying is far worse. maintain the status quo, maintain your investments and, and maintain your long-term strategy. Yes. Um, make sure that's the right strategy though. Um, sure. You know, what is, should you have gold? Should you have, you know, be intelligent about things. We can talk some about that, but you know, really once, the news is hit and the market is down, it's too late. It is really too late. And you and I had the conversation of, like late last year, I think, about, hey, this is a little bit heated up. The economy seems like it's moving a little too fast. The market's moved a little too fast. It's due for a really nice break. You know, it's been, this is the longest bull market on history. There's not been a big pullback. Now, did we know COVID was coming and was in China as we were having that conversation at the Breakfast Club? No, we weren't. We didn't know that. But the fact is markets move in cycles and the degree of the decline here was caused by two things. One was the market earnings were already starting to slow down because the market was overheated. Secondly, COVID, of course, and the government actions around COVID actually. So that was gonna slow things down. I look at it like a big freight train that's going really, really fast. Matter of fact, it was going a little too fast and it should have been slowing down. All of a sudden up on the track, there's this huge semi across the track that would be really bad to hit because it'll derail the train. So the train like locked up its brakes completely and barely made it. Dead stop. Skid marks, damaged tracks, things in the cars got thrown around, stuff, you know, brutal. And it had to stay there for a while until that truck got moved off the tracks. The train will get going again, inevitably, because it's going to go where it's going. Now, some of the food back in the cars may have spoiled and there's some bad stuff going on. It will move again and it'll be slow and it'll get going and it will reach its destination. And that's how I kind of view this whole thing. You know, when we talk about were these self-inflicted wounds, you know, what's COVID, what's policy? Yeah, there's a lot going on there for sure. 
So, so describe what that, I like that analogy, by the way, Dale. Dale has great analogies, by the way. And so what would that semi-truck be that was going to stop the economy? And are you saying now we put the brakes on is what you're saying? Well, we didn't just put the brakes on. Um, we locked them and we skidded for about a mile. With a so whole what was of- going to be the actual crash? What yeah. was that going, what was, well, let's say it wasn't COVID-19 and the government didn't intervene. What do you kind of predict was going to be that crash? Because you're saying it, it was going to, it's going to happen. We were going to have, we were going to have a bear market. Um, we were overdue for one. Yeah. And COVID was a catalyst and it's a big catalyst. It's an unknown. But I'll come back to, you know, we've had these sorts of catalysts, healthcare, existential crises, and I'll compare to some in, in history, but, you know, COVID was across the tracks. And suddenly the economy got stopped, mandated stopped. You are not allowed to have economic activity. Big difference. You know, but we've had this before. The Spanish flu, 1918, that killed 30 to 50 million people. And we had no vaccines. We didn't fully understand it. Um, And then here's some others most people don't think about. The 1957 Asian flu, that was H2N2. Two million people died worldwide. They estimate, maybe a little more. Uh, 1968 Hong Kong flu, one million people died. That's H3N2. Uh, the bird flu, only that was in 97, and we all freaked out about it, but only 350 people actually died from that flu because it was very virulent and burned itself out. And then the swine flu was another H1 variation that killed 18,000 people in 2009. Now, the interesting thing about it is a lot of people over 60 had some immunity because of those past pandemics I just mentioned. So <laughs> what's different about, you know, you know this way more than I, what's different about coronavirus? There's no natural immunity to it. There's nobody really that has immunity. So it's, it is dangerous for sure. And I don't think we should ever take it lightly, um, but this too will pass. Let's look at some other existential crises. 9-11, I encourage everybody to think about the day after 9-11, what was happening? Our world Nothing. changed in a Nothing. moment. Yeah. No flights, no anything. Yeah. Nobody went anywhere because of the fear. Um, Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, most people don't remember the late seventies. That was a long drawn out existential crisis. The dollar went off the gold standard and hyperinflation started in our country. So we forget, I could go on for a long time. We forget these crises and they're all existential crises that are really scary. And wall street likes to shrug and, you know, get all the chaff chaff out every so often. And this was going to happen. Now, this flu is a serious thing. It's a serious economic thing. And countries, it's very interesting to watch how all the countries in the world have dealt with it economically. Yeah. Because it varies. Well, that's interesting. So what great advice. And so what you're, what I think what you're showing is just history shows that this is, I'm not saying it's not different. I'm not, I'm not minimizing what it is. I'm not saying it's not a bad thing. But these things have happened in history, financial history, I mean, economic history. You, everything you've listed has been in the last 100 years, essentially. And we've gone through them all. And so it's certainly true. I, I remember 9-11. I was actually on an airplane during 9-11 as we were pulling away from the tarmac. The attack was happening, and we didn't know it. I, as I was boarding the plane, I'm in Spokane Airport, and I'm watching planes dive into the Twin Towers. And nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew. And we're like, well, that's kind of weird. Oh, and then another one. Well, that's really weird. But we got on the plane, and the pilot, we were pulling out, so we didn't take out, off, and the pilot says, We've been grounded by the FAA. Never happened that he knew of in his career. He says, go get yourself a cup of coffee. I'm sure we'll be back on the plane in just a minute. Well, we're getting a cup of coffee. And Six then one, hit, one hits the Pentagon. We yep. knew we weren't going anywhere. <laughs> and, but it was, and that was it. We were going to do some business, actually. And business, it certainly um, curtailed for a long time. Um, but yeah, it, it, it did come back, but what a great historical perspective, Dale. I, I really appreciate that. So if we, if we think about that historical perspective and know we're going to get out of it, I love that optimism, but what do you see as the current effects or if you are described it of COVID-19 on the economy? What, do, what do you, I mean, can you speak some numbers that people can really relate to there? Yeah, it's severe. It's very severe. Um, and this was going to happen with or without government intervention. Things were going to slow down and probably have negative GDP. Just, you know, even if people were just being wise and staying in and doing this themselves, the government intervention has created a dead stop with huge skid marks behind it. You know, if you're in the restaurant industry, if you're in any service industry, if you're in 
almost anything that involves interactions between human beings that isn't essential, you're laid off. So uh, we have, I think I've got it up here, the unemployment claims that just came out, brutal. Um, unemployment claims, all time high, 6.6 .6 million last week. And a little more than that the prior week. Um, you know, that's from a couple of hundred thousand per week on average over the past few years. So, you know, the unemployment rate is gonna spike, skyrocket. And so that's, that's serious economic damage. There's economic activity that's never gonna happen again. Meals not eaten at restaurants, plane flights not taken, hotel rooms not used, let alone cruise ships, if we'll ever use those again, I don't know. I, I um, agree. Probably we will. It's yeah. amazing how many people were afraid to fly after 9-11. That's true. Yeah, well, that's that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, these things will pass in every way. Um, yeah. So, you know, the numbers are brutal. Apple iPhone sales fell 23% in a month. Uh, Chinese auto sales fell 82%. Boom, year over year, 82% down. So basically they sold one tenth as many cars. Ours are probably going to follow. The auto sales aren't out yet, but they're probably going to follow that. You know, I could go on and on and on. Um, stock market damage, obviously. You're having those massive declines, now we've gotten more than half of them back, but that leaves a mark. That's real economic value wiped out. And remember, if those economic, those bottoms in the market, for every somebody buyer, those prices are set by people buying and selling. So somebody sold down there. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a hedge fund that's down $2 billion. And it's a $5 billion hedge fund, right? But, well, I, I, I like that analogy. My, my, my dad used to always say that is, somebody's selling because they think it's a good price, but somebody's buying because it's a good price. And it's, yep. that's what the market, that's what the free market does. And so that's absolutely, there's somebody that thinks it's an opportunity to sell and somebody that takes an opportunity to, to buy. So that's a great analogy. Yeah. The reality is, you know, bear markets are really good at allocating capital to those who want to panic to the over to those who want to do some analysis and figure out what companies are going to survive. Very good at reallocating the capital between those two groups and saying, you want to panic? Okay. Here's some other people that will buy at these prices. And, you know, in times like this, it's great to say I got in at the bottom or whatever. You just look at absolute valuations. And frankly, um, if a company's going to survive, there could be some generational lows here. There, things are cheap. Now, not everything is cheap. I'll come back to that a little bit. Some sectors are actually, you know, Amazon didn't really miss a beat. They're actually <laughs> higher now. Right. Why? People think it's because of all the online deliveries and home, and yes, that's important, and that spiked. Amazon Web Services is where everything's hosted. I mean, it's hosted there or on Microsoft's Azure and a couple other companies. So everything going onto the web is huge for those companies. I see, yeah. Huge. And, you know, that's, the market recognizes that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot going on, and we're just talking stocks. Um, most of my job, we have a minority of the assets in stocks. We have a lot of muni bonds. Um, there will be some distress there. We have a lot of gold right now. And that's because of the things we'll probably talk about. Gold's horrible investment, except for those times in life when it's the only investment. Yeah. And it doesn't do well. Most people think it does well when the panic's happening. No, it's usually used as a source of capital. When it does well is in the years after that governments tend to print a whole bunch of money out of thin air. Gold is a currency. And it's the anti-paper currency, anti-dollar, if you will. So, you know, we're actually positioned there. And I think that's pretty interesting. That is very, very interesting. So speaking of government intervention and printing money and, and you know, I, I don't, I, I want to hear your take on it. It, it. So let's just think about government interventions. Obviously, I think there's probably like a lot of our society now, there's two sides of this coin and don't necessarily, I'm not going to take one side or the other at this point. I don't think it's appropriate economically in this particular podcast, but was the government intervention needed? And what, what I want, I want you to make sure, Dale, that we're not biased in a political perspective, that it's more economic. So what would you take in your economic expertise? Was government intervention needed? Right. And this is not a conservative or liberal issue at all. I absolutely think it was necessary. Whether the wounds were self-inflicted or not is another matter, but we are where we are. We were where we were. And, you know, there are people that need to put food on the table. A lot of people. So these programs to push capital out to, to help people for something that wasn't their fault. Coronavirus wasn't their fault. They made good decisions. They were working hard. They needed help. And I'm glad the government got it out. Um, you know, some of the programs, you can't pass an 800 page bill in a week 
and then expect it to go smoothly. So people complain about it not going smoothly, but you know what? They've distributed almost $400 billion into the economy, into people's accounts in very short order with the help of banks and things like that. But it's, you know, of course it didn't go smoothly, but it went, it got done. I have to agree with you. It was actually, you know, when I first heard about whether I agree with it or not, I, when I first heard about the stimulus program, I'm like, man, that's going to take months, months to get my, and then all of a sudden people are like, oh, I got X amount of dollars in my account. I'm like, interesting. I mean, I, so it is, it is interesting how fast it actually, it did mm-hmm. happen. So it's Im, 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 impressive. And so let's, let's think about this. What, what do you think would happen if the government didn't intervene? Now, it's, okay, so what, here's the deal. What you keep saying, self-inflicted wounds. And I, I assume what you mean by that is the government, okay, COVID-19 happens. Nobody can help that. Let's just say that that is inevitable. We couldn't do anything about it, right? It's an extrinsic fact that we can't, that we have to face. Right. So then the government, are you saying by shutting down self-inflicted wounds upon the economy, is that what you're saying? Yeah, in a way. Um, now, I don't know what the right answer to this. I am not smart enough, qualified enough, and I'm not wearing a white lab coat, nor have a DR in front of my name. So, you know, I don't know. There are other countries like Sweden that have done some very interesting things. They said, if you get sick, you quarantine yourself if you do this. And maybe it's the Swedish stoicism where they say, you know, things will happen and we all do our best to muddle through together. But it's, it's kind of a, I guess Americans had to be forced in some ways because Sweden did it voluntarily and their outcomes look bad, but they aren't testing anybody that's not sick. So who knows what their rates are? Yeah, we don't but, we won't you know, know all those results. Back, for back to the U.S., there's two types of stimulus. There's what went to individuals and businesses, and those are crucial. What people don't realize is that there's several times that amount that's been for market intervention. So when panics happen, the prices of securities crash, right? There's, it's, just, it's not that there's anything wrong with a bond that the issuer is going to go bankrupt. No, there's no bid for it. Nobody wants to buy it. Nope, it's just, nope, 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 nope. We don't want it. And the bids dry up. Because it's everybody's been, hanging on to their cash. They don't want to bid on anything. Everybody want wants cash at any price. Okay. And so they're selling actually good quality assets. And this happened in 2008 too. They're selling good quality assets to raise liquidity. And the problem there is some of the good quality assets are the overnight funding mechanisms companies use to make payroll. Some of them are interbank loans. Some of them are other things. And by the way, the Fed started intervening in the what they call the repo market, which is how banks loan each other money, last October. And nothing to do with coronavirus. And it was the first time they'd intervened since the financial crisis, since like 2009, 2010. So that got a lot of attention for people on Wall Street, including me. And we were kind of like, why? It's kind of like a bunch of ambulances come whipping up to a building and a bunch of guys rush inside. And then a guy comes out and says, no, there's nothing wrong. Don't worry about it. Well, like, why are the ambulances? <laughs> so it was that sort of, that sort of mechanism going on. But Interesting. You know, back to your point, it's, did we need to shut down? I don't know. Probably we did. Yeah. Probably. And probably we've changed the vector of this disease greatly because we bought some time. And back to why we're going to muddle through this. Um, there was some news from a company, I won't name my name, on Friday. Um, with a drug, an antiviral that's been used before in similar outbreaks. Sure. Great, great outcomes. Yeah. There is hope. And that's just one. There's 20 others. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult to try to trade around those things. And I wouldn't recommend it because one day they're going to be up 20 and the next day they're going to be down 20. And yeah, it's always, not, it, yeah. Being in the pharmaceutical industry myself, I, I especially, I know it's always uh, buy the rumor and sell the news. Right. And, yep. and that particular company, I, I, great company, by the way, anybody that's in science, I won't mention them either. I don't want to sound like I'm a pro. Well, they're, they're a good company. And you know they're what? Whether they have the antiviral or not. Yeah. I've owned them for a long time. Yeah. And that's why I don't mention them. They're, they're, kind of the first, they're kind of the first ones to really come up with some of the antivirals that they did. Yeah. And, you know, they're 26 something billion dollar companies. So yeah. it's, it's great. This is not their, yeah. their main pony. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of hope to be had. And what's happened in past things, we just need to calm the spread until an antiviral comes. That's not a vaccine, of course. Antivirals, though, are treatments that right. make outcomes better and not as many people die, and then a vaccine comes, and then each year you're gonna get your flu shot and your corona shot. 
Well, it's a, and, and that's possible. And I want to I want to expand on that just a little bit as a scientist. And so for those of you who know me, I, I do work in that industry. I have a PhD in chemistry. So I'm not an immunologist or I'm not a biologist necessarily. So I'm not saying vaccines are, are, are necessarily my expertise. But as a scientist, I have studied up on it. And what we do know is this vaccine, I'm just letting you know, just factually, it may or may not work. Right. You know, like like, for example, let's think about a flu vaccine every year. A flu vaccine isn't for every strain that we know of. It's just, so we don't know what COVID-19 is doing and how it's mutating and how it's going to change, what it'll look like next year. So anyway, I, I am very hopeful for a vaccine and I'm also also very not skeptical, but realistic to just say, hey, let's let the data come out and see where it goes. But to shut, that's going to be 12 or 18 months from now, probably. Right. And to shut an entire economy down for the rest of that time and even even lots of social isolation, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but the more and more testing we do is, and I'm, I'm actually going to be tested myself here very shortly because I want to know. Been, by the way. Yeah, I want to know. I recommend it. That test sucks. <laughs> they, they touch your brain basically with a swab. But Oh, is that right? So you got one already? Yeah, I did. So. Oh, wow. Did you come back positive or negative or you got the results? Negative. negative. So right? there's a Wall Street CEO that was positive three weeks okay. ago and it's recovered and so, and I know a lot of people have been positive being as my primary office is in Kirkland, Washington, by sure. the way. So, yeah. you know, that's, um, I don't know, if you look, to get back to, we didn't really answer your original question. What mark is this going to leave? There's two marks and there's the GDP, gross domestic product. What is our economy doing? Various aspects of that, it's expected to shrink. The economic output is expected to shrink between 15 and 30%, depending on which economist you talk to this quarter. So these three months, yeah. second quarter of 2020. Now it's really a matter of how fast does it come back? How fast does that train get going again? How fast is it a V-shaped recovery or is it more of a W or is it kind of this low L, they call it L-shaped recovery that takes forever. Okay. And I hope it's a V-shaped because that really gets a lot of economic activity going on again. One big difference here is the ability of the Fed and the treasury to do what they've done in short order. It took months to get these programs up and running in 08 to, to stabilize markets to do that. You know, the muni bond market is largely stabilized now, the repo market's largely stabilized. And because the Fed's buying everything in sight. And I'll come back to what printing money does to the world long term, <laughs> because um, you know, many times this is the solution better than the cure, or is you know, is it worth problem? I don't know. It's that's an interesting thing to ask, and I think it's important. But the fact is, you've got a patient on the table, and you have to fix it now, and that's what's happening. Right. Well, so the damage is extreme, but what's different here is the government just pumped almost a third of the value of our economy into our economy. Wow. So that's unprecedented. Yeah, that's that is so, so we're we're on that we're on that point of predictions for future economy, and we'll get to mm -hmm. in the sectors and businesses and so on and so forth. So for you though, that are watching live on Facebook, I can see some of you live, that are watching live, ask some questions. If you have questions for me or for Dale, you know, I, I, I give him the economy ones. Uh, it, it's uh, macro, I'm really, I, I'm, I tend to have a good, good handle on microeconomics, like, you know, um, but on a financial scale, a large global scale, I'm not really a macroeconomics guy. So ask those things. And he's going to talk about printing money and globally and all those things that, and the, which is very important macroeconomics wise, but ask those questions, ask those questions on Facebook. We'll get, we'll get to them if we can. And so, and thank you guys for, for tuning in. So, so we're kind of get down that road of prediction for future economy. And so I've been following this, you know, at a, at a, a very high level, but you know, we've got different sectors, commodities, they've been highly affected, which is really different ones in different ways, which is interesting. I don't know if you, if you follow commodities at all, Dale. Yes, I do. Okay. So, but then there's <laughs> financial sectors, healthcare sectors. And so let's talk about some of those, those models and those sectors, but also what I think's happening here. And I, I, you know, I'm definitely a free market guy. I'm a capitalistic guy. I like free markets to work. I also know that sometimes government intervention and you're educating me on that is necessary. And is that truly a free market? I don't know how to decide that. But I think what we're seeing here is we might see some old models and new models for sectors. Some of those sectors may not ever be the same. And so what, what do you think of commodities, financial, healthcare, 
Um, what, 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 what sectors do you see that have been changed forever? Service sectors, what, what, what are you thinking? Oil is the big one that comes to everybody's mind because energy runs the economy, right? And uh, background there, oil falls when economic activity goes down. So people driving less, less goods moving, less big ships cruising across the ocean, oil falls. And so it's a barometer. Now, what got better this time after oil was already falling is that Russia decided not to let a good crisis go to waste and did its best to crater the price of oil by saying, we're not gonna cut out, but we're just gonna keep pumping and pumping. And of course, the more there is of something, if no one's buying it, turns out the price goes down. So why did they do that? Well, you understand Russia can kind of pump how much they want. It's just there. They have an and unlimited supply is what you're saying. Pretty much. Saudi Arabia, <laughs> also similar to that there. And, and it's really how much does it cost to take out of the ground? Certain producers in the US, the majority of them, the shale producers, the frackers, for lack of a better word, cost them a lot, 45, 50, 55 per ounce, depending on the company. Or, I'm sorry, per, per barrel, not ounce. And so when oil quote, goes down below 30, they might go out of business for real. And some of them deserve to. I, they were, I, I know they were in debt that. up to their eyeballs yeah. and were doing this. It wasn't sustainable. I know now, with that plan. said, the U.S. had become and is energy independent we can supply all of our own oil if we want to. That sort of bothers Mr. Putin, I think. Yeah. So he really wanted to put some of these guys out of business and put some pressure on some of the uh, Middle East players as well. Some of them have pretty high cost of production. So he will be successful in that way, if, unless the government in the US bails some of them out, which that would be one personally I would have an issue with because I would rather see the lower cost, better run companies with less debt survive. Yeah. because that's better management and they're better for everything. They also, I think, better for the environment, better for the economy, all of that. So now, not, not to not to put anybody on the spot, and I don't want to name them either, but are you talking even some of the big players that everybody would recognize that where they gas up at these certain stations or get gas from? Most of them are distributors and then they have um, what they call exploration and production, E&P, on the other end of that. Okay. And they're not necessarily the same company. Some of them do own their own wells, but they tend to be better run, you know, more environmentally friendly. There's about 300 little tiny companies that started up, went public, and they're all in an index. If you want to look at an index on AMLP, they're all in there. And some are going to survive. The ones that are going to survive are ridiculously cheap. And then there's the ones that aren't going to survive. And they're not cheap because they're going to be interesting. Interesting. So there's, there's going to be a lot of pain and energy. I'll, I'll move through these pretty quick. Best performing commodity, orange juice. Frozen orange juice flew off the shelves for the past few months. All the stuff that's not in in wow. grocery stores, turns out it's up, okay? Yeah. Um, because anytime there's a shortage, the price is gonna go up. Uh, precious metals are a commodity. Now silver is an industrial metal and it hasn't really moved. Gold dipped initially because it was used as a source of liquidity and it has started to climb ever since. Yesterday went down a little bit. So it's not necessarily negatively correlated to the stock market, but in general, they don't, it's just non-correlated. It doesn't mean they're going like this, it just means they're going to move at different times over time. Yeah. So gold isn't a commodity. It's a currency. So I don't really count it, even though it shows up as a commodity. And all the agricultural commodities, um, their prices are down. You know, yeah. onions, wheat, things like that. Why? Because they're not moving and there's no one to buy them. And even though everybody wants that stuff, they want the food, they want frozen food. There's a supply chain problem because some of the factories that process the food are shut down because of COVID. So, so you know, I don't know, I don't know enough about, even, especially commodities that are traded and aren't traded. But what about beef and pork and fowl and you know, what, what, what are are those traded? And what are you seeing in that particular industry? Okay. Yep, they are. Um, we use a manager that does that. I'm, I'm commodity licensed, but I'm never going to trade commodities because I think it's a good way to look stupid, and I already know <laughs> enough ways to look stupid. So, um, I hire professionals for that, but. You know, in that world, yes, all of those are traded. All of those have contracts attached to their price. And these days they have ETFs, but those have some um, flaws that I would often guide people away from, except for short term. But those are all traded. Um, in commodities, though, remember, you're, you're always trading against a professional. And the professionals statistically win about 80% of the time in the commodities world. Yeah. So that's why I don't tend to go there. And uh, nowadays, you're not trading against really smart, experienced floor traders. You're trading against supercomputers, yeah. and they usually win. So, 
that is a market that is interesting and you know there's a lot of shortages but the shortages are not necessarily translating to higher commodity prices because the producers you know we have wheat farmers around here if that wheat is stuck on a bunch of barges or in grain elevators the farmers aren't getting full price for it and that's you know commodities are at different points in the food chain if you will for lack of a better word and those points are where commodity prices are set so the price for wheat that's been delivered in a different port versus wheat leaving here might be radically different right now. Sure. Radically yeah. different. So anyway, very strange times of commodities. Um, we well, it's, it's interesting. Stuff, right? Well, speaking of tr- commodities, so obviously, you know, one of the, what, what we're seeing is actually, obviously what we know is one of the most nutrient dense foods is meat. You can get all your amino acids, all your proteins, all your fats from meat. You can get all the nutritional value you can from meat. So I have seen that it's mm-hmm. more difficult to get meat. And so I've actually gone to my local locker and so on and so forth that we call. And they, they, they have their own meat products and so on and so forth instead of the grocery stores. But it's interesting. I don't know if you heard what Wyoming did. So mm-hmm. because the, I didn't really realize this, but all meat has to be processed. And you talked about some of the food processors. Well, you know, a lot of people think when you food processors, they think about making wheat into crackers and stuff like that, or, or wheat into bread, you know, in a big facility. And obviously those have been shut down. So there's, it, it's, or there's been some challenges there. Let's just put it that way. Maybe not shut down, but there's challenges. Well, I guess the same things have happened to some of the larger meat processors. And so it, it, for example, one of the places in, was in South Dakota that got shut down. It was a, it was a pork processor and a lot, like half the staff had COVID-19 or something like that. Mm-hmm. So they shut them down and they, ha- they had about four to 5% of the, of the market in, in pork processing in the, in the nation. So they were seeing this and what Wyoming did, and that was really interesting. And I think it, it, it might change the sector. I don't know. I'm surprised Idaho hasn't followed. Wyoming said, okay, we see this is going to be a problem to get meat, to processors, from processor to the consumer. So they let ranchers sell directly to consumers. Wyoming did that a couple of weeks ago. And it's actually- Yeah, that would work in some states. I'm, I'm very, very confident that would not work in Seattle. It would not. <laughs> if, you look, if you look at really where meat is consumed volume-wise, yeah. you know, it's, it's not here because most of the people are not here. Yeah, so the agreed. processing and commodity prices are always going to be, I mean, I think that's genius personally. I mean, I also hunt, so, yeah. you know, I would not try to, uh, I don't know. I would not try to turn a cow into steaks personally. I don't think I'm qualified, but you know, I think it's interesting. And if things get really bad, that's certainly, you're going to start seeing trends like that Yeah, and people pop up. What the FDA probably won't ever say is you can sell to your neighbor. You can, but you're going to find the guy, you know, if, if you're in a city and things stay this way, which I don't think they will, there's going to be one really popular guy that you take your cow to. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. It yeah. happens to be the butcher down at Safeway. So right. there are things like that, but you know, processing in certain foodstuffs involves a little more messy than processing your frozen vegetables. Yeah. So how do you think this, the, how do we the, get down this rabbit hole? <laughs> I, I love it. That's what I love about this podcast is that it's so organic. It's like, it's really cool. And it's just like, we, we do things on the fly that it's not just, you know, um, checking, checking the boxes. And so, so how do you think with talking about all these things? And I mean, this is kind of one of them that uh, 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 one of the trends right now in the nutrition industry is to kind of try to eat as locally as possible you know, try mm-hmm. to eat as locally as possible. And that, that may be happening with some of this, possibly, you know, it may change that paradigm. So, but as an example of that, so how do you think business or fiscal policy has changed forever? Do you think this, or do you think it really has? Or do you, just, you think it's just one of those historical things that, what do you think? Well, I think the definition of business should include the ability to change quickly to changing circumstances. Successful businesses are the ones who know how to change. I just saw a cartoon the other day with this guy in a boardroom with his board saying, you know, we don't really need to <clears throat> bring our company to the internet. Um, you know, something like we don't need to modernize. We're doing just fine. And there's this huge wrecking ball coming from outside the window. <laughs> since COVID, right? yeah. So there are going to be some major, major technological changes. Yeah. And some of them are what we call software as a service. You'll hear SaaS. SAAS, software as a service. There's a lot of companies. Zoom is a software as a service, yeah. right? Yeah. We're buying a product where, you know, companies are paying to use Zoom. And, you know, 
But there's a lot of companies like that where they are a service online. Companies are realizing something. Um, I talked about all the industries that have been, you know, just cratered, just stopped in their tracks. But by and large, technology, finance, things like that, Wall Street are still operating. You know, my entire team, my entire company globally, and it's tens of thousands of people, right? They are all, for the most part, working from home yeah. and working well. It's working. Um, security, big deal. The more distributed we get, the more security is important. I Fearless prediction, I don't know if it's going to happen or when, or if it does, we probably won't hear about it. But there's going to be a major hacking attack into some big targets because everything suddenly going virtual creates soft targets. The guy working from home that used to just be a teller and now is remoted in to the bank, if he has sloppy internet hygiene, he's get, he could actually be, that's the weakest link to that whole bank. And by the way, that bank is connected to other banks. So yeah. um, the big guys aren't who I'm worried about. It's usually the smaller regional banks that don't have controls. Sure. I won't go yeah. through the security procedures I have to go through, but there are a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, nope. But there's going to be, so cybersecurity is going to become an even bigger thing because there's going to be some high profile attacks or suddenly everybody's just going to start acting that way because something happened we don't know about. So cybersecurity is a big deal. Internet bandwidth is a big deal. Um, places like rural Idaho and Wyoming, and the middle of the country between the two coasts, doesn't have great internet right now. Right. And it's kind of creaking. You know, there's been some heroics going on behind the scenes to keep traffic moving because the pipes, for lack of a better word, you know, the, the backbone of the internet doesn't go everywhere still. Right. Uh, I don't know if you guys have looked up at night. Okay, this is a big rabbit hole, but it's a really cool one. Um, <clears throat> Elon Musk has been launching his satellites and eventually he's going to have 40,000 low orbit communication satellites that will do low latency, very high bandwidth internet globally. Wow. And, you know, I won't go to the technology. It's cool. Look it up. It's called Starlink. Anyway, he's been launching these every so often. And when they come out for the first few days, they all go in a line and they're incredibly bright as they deploy their solar panels. And you can see them. I think tonight at 824 might be too light and cloudy still, but, uh, tomorrow at 10, 10 p.m. Pacific time, there's, they're coming over again. They literally look like really bright stars right in a row, about an inch apart, all the way across the sky. There's 40 of them at time. And they literally just move across the sky. And, you know, think about what's going to happen. Think about technology and things like that, bringing the internet. Who's it going to displace? Sometimes what a technology or new product or something displaces is important to know in investing as even investing in that technology. Yeah. If they're going to take out traditional internet providers somehow and make their services less valuable or less desirable, that tells you something. How does it affect Netflix? To do that, you have to understand how Netflix works and how it serves up movies right to a server near you, not in New Jersey. You have to understand all these things. Yeah. Um, a lot is gonna change technologically. The big guys actually are pretty well positioned because they see this and they're already going there. Um, you know, a lot of other things, everything creates changes. I mean, the 2008 crisis created the Dodd-Frank Act, which totally remodeled Wall Street. Some things for the better that needed to change. A lot of things, not so much. You know, and the, but they undid, they undid uh, several of those, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Some of the more onerous ones that were actually hurting consumers. Yeah, they, they ended. So, you know, um, what robotics, AI, artificial intelligence, yeah. um, you know, robotics for delivery of things and construction of things and logistics and how we get things to point A to point B. You know, Amazon bought a robotics company and nobody paid attention to it two years ago. They're going to, they're building several fully automated logistics plants. I've heard, um, you know, physical infrastructure, you get all this fed money just dumping in the economy. Hopefully it's always promised and doesn't usually happen, but hopefully some of it actually repairs bridges and roads. And maybe we have, you know, Elon Musk's hyperloop, you know, maybe those things happen finally. Maybe there's actually capital for them when we're just trying to move ahead so quickly. So, and in healthcare, um, there already are some changes in healthcare, real-time testing and some technologies that are going to come out because there are people who are going to see opportunity in this and invent cool new stuff. That's definitely happening in the, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's cool. Yeah. Who's, what's going away? Um, I don't know. Everybody's predicting cruise ships are never going to be used again. Uh, Remains to be seen. I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's a that's a real tough one. Um, certainly, it's not, I probably wouldn't jump on right away, even though I'm not really afraid of this virus, so to speak. But why would I do that type of thing? You know, and 
I just wonder how that industry recovers. Right. What if your um, one week cruise turns into a, you know, Gilligan's Island type of cruise on a ship, you know, right. so <laughs> exactly. that's, that's the concern with that industry. Um, flight, I think airlines come back pretty quickly. Boeing's up and running again, they're starting production. Um, automobiles, I think there's gonna be some great deals this year. Cause yeah, there's that's a true. lot of full yeah. stock lots. And I'm personally gonna buy a new car cause, um, Truck's getting a little long in the tooth, and it's too long anyway. I'll put it in my garage. So, I mean, there's a lot of things coming that there's going to be economic activity. It just might not be in exactly the same places that lost the activity before. Well, you that know, it's interesting. That's great macroeconomics. I'm just going to think more micro, um, Dale, and think about, like, my, you know, people in my industry and how many are working virtually now. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we're in the laboratory industry, so there's definitely hands-on work. But I want to think about that person that's been used to working virtually maybe for two months now. And when they go back to work, they're going to be thinking possibly, why can't I do this virtually? You know, and so how does it change the mindset of the actual worker? Like, wait, I can, I can truly do a lot of this at home and still maybe balance my home and, and family life and my work life. I, I don't know. You know, we'll have to see where that, where that goes. Obviously, there's some things that you've got to do at work. But I've also wondered about this to think about how it's changed the restaurant industry, right? So a lot of restaurants now, and if, gosh, I feel pretty lazy, but almost the majority in Moscow, Idaho anyway, they do DoorDash deliveries and deliver, some of them deliveries for free. I wonder if people are going to get used to that. I know I'm doing it right now. So, I mean, when we're out of this in midsummer, possibly, hopefully, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to order something. Yeah, and they, we'll just and come here. I don't have to get up. <laughs> well, let's, let's totally geek out about what you just said, though. If workers can stay from home, the other side of that is companies can say, hey, wow, um, they don't all need to be here. Maybe once in a while we bring them in and for cultural purposes, but they don't actually need to work from here in this industry. What effect does that have on companies that do rental office space? Absolutely. You what need effect less does it have on the real estate market? Yeah. You know, what is that really going to do if home becomes work for more and more people? Yeah. It's going to change the dynamics of office space and real estate and things like that and big towers in downtown areas. Maybe, subtly, but maybe. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. You know, the DoorDash thing, how about self-driving cars? I don't know if you've been in, an, in a uh, Tesla. I, I've, never, I've been, been in one. I've never watched it self-drive. So okay, I have a scary cool. story. One of my associates has a Tesla 3 he bought, and it has autopilot on it. And you're supposed to keep your hands on the wheel because – by law, you're supposed to be driving, right? Well, he bought a fishing weight and tied it onto the steering wheel. So his steering wheel thinks his hands are on it all the time. He actually went from downtown Bellevue to Yakima, Washington, you know, 150 miles or so. Yeah. Never touched his wheel, point of pride. And I was kind of needle him out, say, yeah, really? And he just, he's on the freeway. We're going 60. <laughs> on I-5. Like and it, yeah. And it got us into our office, into the parking lot, and he never touched the wheel again. <laughs> due to the nap. I was blown away. And we're starting to see metrics, if you look at some of the Bloomberg articles, that autopilot is safer on average than human drivers now. They've gone about 2 billion miles and that's the metrics are coming up because autopilot learns. Yeah. And of course, I am way better a driver than autopilot. And I of never course, me too. Driving, <laughs> and so I'm sure I don't factor into that, but those are the facts. That's and interesting. over time, yeah. um, you know, talk DoorDash, talk all this stuff, what robots and AI are going to be in the thing that brings your food to your door. And especially Absolutely. in cities. I mean, we're in Moscow, Idaho. It boggles my mind. It's happening here. But, you know, cities, it's been there for a long time. And I think that's going to continue. Yeah. Well, so be a lot so more. more macro wise. So obviously we've seen some issues with, um, and this, this always concerned me. I mean, being in that industry in the healthcare industry and pharmaceutical industry, you know, a lot of things have been offshore to Asia. It, mm -hmm. over the last, oh, certainly over the last um, two decades, for sure. Right. A lot of our generics, generics are, are at least the active pharmaceutical ingredient is made in Asia, India or China, and then they might finally assemble it somewhere else, maybe Mexico or Puerto Rico or a, a, a U.S. territory. A lot of not, times, not the U.S. anymore. They shut down a lot of the manufacturing for pharmaceuticals and whatnot when it was more cost-effective to go overseas. So, and obviously now, a lot of our, our medical equipment, even just masks, gloves, all those disposable items, 
they're, they come from another country, you know? So what do you see how that's going to change how we do business in the United States? What, what, what are you hearing on Wall Street? Is that going to come back and we're going to manufacture here? Are we going to have, you know, a hands-off approach? What, what, what are you thinking on that? Um, there was, well, I think economically, above my pay grade, frankly, but economically, yes, a lot of countries in Asia and here are going to start saying, hey, maybe we should actually make our antibiotics, our medical supplies, yeah. and maybe some other stuff too. Maybe we should make those here. Maybe yeah. we should make those because supply chains get stretched. The other thing that when you get massive economic dislocations on top of trade wars, on top of currency dislocations, that's what causes real conflict. And so I think a lot on Wall Street are kind of sitting back going, okay, okay, Putin did a really aggressive, nasty thing in deciding to pump all, you know, why would you do that in the middle of a crisis? Well, yeah. he saw advantage to it. So a lot of people are sitting back going, what aggressive moves are various countries going to make? What bad actors might try to do something when they see a weakened state of our country? I, I've been impressed and surprised. We've probably fought some of those off, who knows? But you know, I think those are real things to consider. I also think it's most people are realizing, hey, we're pretty unprepared. You know, I know people in Seattle who make a lot of money and can afford to do whatever they want. They had two days of food in the house. Wow. I won't even talk about the toilet paper situation, but the days have become very popular in Seattle suddenly. So, you know, the French have got that one right potentially. But I think there's there's so many changes. And if you just think through them and how they affect economies, a lot is going to change. And as you said, much of it for the better. Yeah. Much of it for, hey, maybe we shouldn't just go build it because we can do it 10 cents an hour cheaper over there. Maybe, maybe that should stay here. Well, maybe you know that's more healthy because we're not spending a bunch of money shipping it either or, or burning oil for that matter. Maybe right. doing it here is okay. Well, you know, when I, when I started watching the offshoring and I, I tend to Obviously, the, I'm, I'm very pro-American. I like jobs here. I like all the jobs here, all the way from skilled labor to non-skilled labor, uh, manufacturing, all the way to highly skilled um, technical jobs. Mm -hmm. all in, when, I, when, when I first saw a lot of the offshoring happening, I was just telling myself, and, and being a business owner myself, a lot of times you save on the front end, but it will cost you in the back end. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a lot, lot more. And here's what I always say is there's always an opportunity cost. That is sometimes, I'm actually, I'm sure that you guys can put a return on investment on those, on an opportunity cost. But a lot of times it's not even calculatable. Like think about what we're dealing with now, masks and gloves and uh, antibiotics or antivirals or whatever we can't get. That, that cost is really hard to put a number on. Besides, it's so valuable, it can't put a number on it. And so- mm -hmm. So that, that's what I think is that a lot of those things that you're talking about, it's like, yeah, we might have saved some 10 cents an hour on the front end, but it's going to cost us. So a lot of that will come back. And that, I don't know, we'll see. I think, a, and that'll be for maybe most economies in the world that they'll be more, I guess, try to be self-funded for certain, self-centered for certain things, for sure. That's interesting. Um, Andre, and another thing I wanted to chat about before we run out of time. Um, Offshoring works, and a lot of the metrics that have happened over the past two decades work really well because the dollar has been super strong. So we can go do it over there. You can import it. The dollar buys more stuff made in China because they're in Nibi. The Chinese currency has been low. The dollar has been strong versus everybody. And to use a technical term, it's not because we're that great, you know, any greater than anybody else. It's just we suck less. We're the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry, <laughs> whatever you want, right? So we're all doing this printing money, but they're currencies are down. If the dollar ever weakens, offshoring suddenly makes much, much less sense. Now, these companies hedge the currencies. They do that. But it's been a super long-term trend. And if the dollar becomes the, not the world's reserve currency, you know, say China and Russia pop up and say, hey, it turns out we have a gold-backed currency we're going to launch. It's, you know, blah, 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 blah. Tries to attack capital like the euro did many, many decades ago. You know, new currency out of thin air. And guess what? It's a major currency now. Weird things happen in history. And I think people that don't look at history in that way realize the dollar won't be the reserve currency forever. So I do want to touch on one thing, um, taxes, okay? And this is not a political statement. If I'm a taxpayer, there's two types of taxes that the government actually imposes on us long-term. 
through policy. One is the taxes we pay that are percentages of things, income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, um, fees, you know, levies. There's hundreds of them, actually. I could go on for a while. But <laughs> I'm writing a book on that. I'm writing a book about that right now, actually. That's awesome. Um, you have to come back on the show. I would love, I'd love to uh, promote your book with you. That would be interesting and fun. I just need to finish it probably. The publisher's kind of ticking me. But there's those taxes. Then there's the effect of currency. So as the government goes more and more in debt and prints more and more currency, it's not good for our buying power. You know, I don't know if you remember how much a gallon of gas was when you were growing up, but the decimal was on the complete different side of the number. Absolutely. It's like 0. 0.50, you know, 50, yep. 60 cents. I remember 50, 60 cents a gallon. Yeah. Guess yeah. what? We became more efficient. There's more oil. There's supply and demand in oil is way better than it was back then. Absolutely. What happened? Well, what happened is the dollar buys less. All currencies buy less real stuff. So the value of things, it's not that they have gone up. In many cases, they have a little bit. But what's really happened is our buying power has gone down. So that is another form of tax that most people don't think about. Interesting. All these dollars being printed out of thin air will create inflation, inevitably. It's a rule of economics. I am not smart enough to when, how, how long it takes. It will create inflation. And it's not just the U.S. dollar. That is a form of tax because our buying power, and by the way, it hurts people who are working for a wage more than the wealthy. Sure. The wealthy can hedge around. They can do a lot of things. But it hurts people that are working and living and paying rent and buying food. It hurts them the most. That's when inflation hurts. And so it is a very real tax. And I'm, the Fed's doing a lot of it. And is it necessary? Yes. Um, but I do get disturbed by the answer to every question being money, print more. Or money. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, what's happened in the last 20 years is they don't actually print real money. They don't have to print a bunch of cash that flows around like you see in Weimar Germany and all these past times of history. They just create it on the wire. It's electronic and it just goes into the system. We just saw it. It landed in everybody's accounts. It wasn't even checks. So it's very efficient to do that now. And sometimes the Fed can retire funds. And so it's not that they're out there and can't ever come back. If they buy bonds with it, they're retiring those money, that money when those bonds mature. But just money going out into the economy, it's a, it's that's stimulative, but it's kind of like you get an economy that's on speed and it doesn't like to have the speed taken away later on. It'll crash eventually. Yeah. And I, again, I'm not smart enough whether that takes decades yeah. or whatever. History tells us it just doesn't tend to work out long-term. Yeah. Well, that's, that's and it's a tax. It's, it's a real tax. That, that's really good. I, I can't wait to hear more about your book and I'll have you back on the podcast and I'd love to, to hear more about it. So as we kind of wrap this up, I want to just give, what would you give as like a one minute sound bite or less than a minute? on advice for the majority of people that are watching to say about this pandemic and the economy, what would your advice be with all your background and your experience and wisdom? Hmm. This too will pass and we will muddle through because we always muddle through and there will be opportunities in some wreckage. I love it. That's optimism that knowing that we're, he, I mean, he admits it, where this is destructive. A lot of this is, we know mm -hmm. we're in a recession, but there's optimism that we know that there's going to be something good become of it. That's what optimism is. Not necessarily knowing, not necessarily wanting the outcome that we want, but knowing that there's going to be something good become of it. And why? Because Dale just said it's historic. And I think that's, that's, a, that's amazing. Well, that, that's, that's wonderful. So one of the things that I, I think Dale is a great example of, just this uh, person that grew up in rural America, has a never be out work mindset. He's been on Wall Street. Now he's back in rural America, but still kind of working on Wall Street. Well, definitely working on Wall Street, just virtually, I should say. And so one of the questions I always like to ask people is that, and I think about these in my, things in my own life, and, and I'll share those as we, as we go on in this podcast and these stories, but what one failure would you say, Dale, as an example was maybe somebody would think as a failure, but it led to a success for you. And I, I, I tend to think that we, none of us really have failures unless we decide to just give up. And I, I certainly don't see you as that type of a person. So what one thing might people externally look on your life and say, oh, wow, that was a failure. Maybe even how you defined it was a failure. But then you looked at it and it's like, wow, there was good that became of that. And can you describe that? What would, what would you yeah. share with us? Yeah. Um, first, I need to define failure. And I'll say... Failure is something that was in my control. So my house burned down to the ground 10 years ago, 15 years ago now. 
that was not a failure, right? It sucked, but it wasn't a failure. Um, but I'll go into some two failures that come to mind immediately. One is intentional failure. And that is in every industry, whether you're a doctor, lawyer, you know, financial executive, whatever, you have to start by getting clients in the most case. Not our, you know, not all industries, but you had to go get your first customers, right? At Altars. You had to go get them. Yeah, I, I them, call it, them do business with you. you know what I call it? I call it hustling. That's what you're yeah. doing. You're hustling. But I had a manager, this is back in Washington, DC, when I first started out. He handed me this upside down pyramid. And I personally think it should be the other way, but it was upside down. And he said, okay, see all these hash marks up here? You have to check every one of them off every day. And every one of them is somebody who hangs up on you, swears at you, says, I don't, I'm not interested, go away, whatever. This is before do not call us, by the way. <laughs> to be successful, you had to literally say, okay, I have to fail 50 times because I know on average in that 50 is someone who will talk to me. And out of 100 of them, there's one that will talk to me and actually another that will meet with me. And out of that person that meets with me, if you're really good, they'll become a customer. I had to fail intentionally 50 to 100 times every single time to get a meeting with anybody. Awesome. That was, so that's intentional failure because I, I knew the, it had to I happen. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Okay, then let me go to another one where I was just stupid and I failed, um, which is probably the more the traditional definition of failure. Um, many, many years ago, I was with a company. I had just been made vice president. I thought I was hot stuff and super cool. There was an executive there who's in my position now where I am. And I made an ethics complaint to our anonymous ethics hotline. I was right, by the way, but I was very inartful. I was just, you know, thinking, wow, he's not a nice guy and he's really screwed a lot of people over and that's not ethical. So I did that. Long story short, that was not an anonymous ethics hotline. He had a copy of it in his hand a few days later and I got fired a month later along with five other people. Interesting. I eventually won, you know, arbitration and all that. And they said, yeah, you're right. That, that was, that was not right. But I had a family to support, I had a mortgage, and it destroyed my world. You know, literally a couple of months, and by 9-11 happened in there too, so yeah. It was just brutal. And what did I have to do? I had to work really, really hard. I literally, the day, and I credit my wife with this, I came home and told her, and she literally fell to the floor. The only other time I've seen her fall to the floor in shock was, you know, just holding on to something, was watching our house burn down. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was a big deal because she knew it shook everything. So I literally got on the phone an hour after I got home from that morning. And I called for five days and I called everybody I knew. I networked. This is before the internet was up and running too much. And I had a couple of meetings and I went to a bunch of meetings and finally got it. Um, long story short, I told the story. Here's what happened. Was pretty transparent said yeah here's why i was stupid but here's what happened and i stand by what i did and i found a firm a big firm actually that said oh yeah we know him scumbag they hired me <laughs> and i got a signing bonus and i got promoted wow. and would that have ever happened had i stayed there and was a pretty dysfunctional environment at the time just plugging along and thinking i was really cool and playing all the games that were going on no it wouldn't have it changed me. Now it hurt. It hurt deeply. It left a mark. It took me a long time to recover from. But I got stronger. I got a lot stronger. And it put me on a whole different trajectory that looking back, I wouldn't change that. Yeah. That sounds you know, weird. What a great story. And you know what? I, Dale, um, he's not even being, telling you all the stories of some of his, his uh, what would I say, challenges. And all, all I can tell you is I've really never met any more optimist, anybody more optimistic. And that's an, not only those incredible stories, but the other ones that I know, incredible Dale. And, you know, I was reading something the other day that, that I really want people to kind of think about more. And we talked about it with anxiety and COVID and optimism and how you can learn optimism. But it's like during periods of comfort in your life, there's no growth there. None. That's true. That's true. There's growth during periods of uncomfort. I know that that's where I've grown the most and I want to continue to experience uncomfort. Maybe not as, not always, <laughs> always uncomfortable. Famous last words. Yeah. Famous last what? words, but it's like, I, I'm yeah. thankful for what I have. And I know you are too, Dale. And, and so thank you, Dale. Well, this has been a great podcast. Thank you for sharing your Saturday with us and go enjoy your family and, and uh, 
do what you do on your acres out there. We can see the beautiful trees and the beautiful forest that you live in. And it's a, it's amazing. I'm so glad to know you, Dale. Thank you very, very much. And when that book gets closer, you let me know. And I want to have you back on here and uh, we will talk about your book and, and imposed and non-imposed taxes. It sounds awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dave. Back at you. All right. Hey, Dale, okay, have hey. a good one. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Take care. Okay. All right. Yeah. Bye.